Hi, everybody, and welcome to Travel Tuesday. Please excuse my rather fuzzy background. I'm in a hotel room and have to make the best of uh, the, the poor lighting that hotel rooms so frequently give. But uh, I know we're in for a treat tonight. So it's now my very great pleasure to introduce you to our speaker this evening, Adrian Jones, a retired associate professor of history. He's very frequently heard on ABC Radio. Adrian is a Harvard graduate and is an expert in Greek, Roman, Ottoman, and Balkan history. Now, he leads ASA tours to the Balkans, so I know we're in for a big treat with Adrian Jones telling us about that really fascinating European country, Romania. Okay, it's me, Adrian Jones. I actually trained as a Russianist and a, a Turkologist and did all these studies about the Balkans because that's the place where the two peoples intersect. And that's basically my theme for today's lecture is to talk about this really beguiling, beautiful place called Romania, where, which is a strange kind of island of Romance speakers surrounded by Slavs and with some of the most beautiful scenery in Europe. But basically the defining feature of this Romania on this European map showing the Middle European Corridor, which is a theme I'll pick up in a minute, is the, the Carpathian Mountains sweeping all the way through, through southern Germany, Slovenia, around through Romania. So you've got this arc of mountains called the Carpathians. And that is where we're going to be travelling. And south is the Balkans and north, the Eurasian plain. So we've got this wonderful place fundamentally defined by its relationship with the Carpathian Mountains with a northern arc and a western-eastern arc, and below that, the mighty Danube River. And that's our journey, if you see, roughly sketched with my wayward pencil on their map. We're going to go through these different regions that I've named, Wallachia, kind of old Romania, and then through the mighty passes uh, of the Alt River into Transylvania, where we'll spend a, quite a bit of time exploring, up towards northern Transylvania in the Maramuresh, one of the most beautiful regions with a very interesting history. Through the Carpathians again, and into Moldavia in eastern Romania, if you like, where the wonderful painted churches, we'll see the painted churches about which I'll say so. And then we'll come back again through the Carpathians twice, the Western, the Eastern Carpathians, and then the Southern Carpathians back to Wallachia. So that's our journey. And what we're looking at is one of the primordial landscapes in Europe, that in Romania, you see landscapes that are really are unlike any in Europe in the sense that you're seeing in many ways forests that are primordial and these mighty rivers carving away through these spectacular landscapes. So here we see the route coming from Wallachia near the Danube plain up through the mountains, the Carpathian Mountains, into Wallachia. And it's this theme that I wanted to start the talk with. Because a lot of people today think of Eastern Europe as the kind of minor end of Europe, the bit that's the sort of afterthought. And that's certainly the case in many places in Western Europe, that they don't, they're a bit sceptical about Eastern Europeans. And we're seeing this even in the current security crises, that they had to learn from the Eastern Europeans that the Russians might be a threat. And you see basically a conceptual map about the importance of this region, that this region was the key region in prehistoric Europe. When Western Europe was an utter backwater, this region, the region of the Danube Delta, the Danube River, was the kind of highway of European emerging civilization. And what you have is this thing called the Middle European Corridor, where people came into Europe through the Danube Delta and followed the Danube River and then went over the mountains into the high plains of Transylvania or into the Pannonian Basin. And this was a really important 
avenue for European civilization. Let me try to put some more flesh on this so that in the history of European agriculture, for example, agriculture emerges first in Romania. And so you've got a situation where the lowland people are farming. The first people in Europe to farm are in the lowlands, but they're also combining that with sending their flocks of sheep and goats high into the mountains in the summertime to graze. So you've got this relationship between fertile riverbank lowlands and high plains, high meadows up in the high country. And so this is an important element. So here's a picture of kind of northern Transylvania in the Mara Moorish. And you can see, you get a sense too of the kind of wonderful scenery. So here's what I'm talking about, that in Romania, in kind of prehistoric terms, both in the 38th millennium, boggles the mind that, and in the 8th millennium, this was the center of European civilization. It was important because we know that Neanderthals have been in Europe for about 300,000 years, and people from the uh, Siberia, the so-called Denisovan people, had been in Europe for about 200,000 years. But the Homo sapiens, our kind of people, had only been in Europe for 40,000 years. And it's interesting to compare that, say, to Aboriginal history, where we know that Homo sapiens had arrived in, in Australia 65,000 years ago. So they came into Europe late, but one of the first sites where we know they interacted with Neanderthal people is in Romania in 38,000 BCE. And we also know that European farming started in the Carpathian Basin, both beyond the, the Carpathians into what we would call Transylvania and down in Wallachia on that part of Romania, which is bordering the Danube River. And that happened at 7,700 BCE, way before, nearly a millennium and a half before Britain. So it takes some time for people. And we also know that the people, because of DNA evidence, that the people doing the farming at this early time were the same people who were hunter-gathering in the millennia before. So what we've got is a region in terms of the development of farming and the development of the kind of population of Europe, which is absolutely central, despite what Western Europeans might think and believe. So if we look at the regions of Romania, and here again, I've carved out with my rough pen, the, the trip that we're making, we're going through, remember the arc of the Carpathians swinging around like this? We're going to go through the Carpathians three or four times, and that's always a great thing to do, going through these mountain passes. And we're going to go through, Wallach, start in Wallachia and make our way to Transylvania, explore different aspects of Transylvania, move towards the north to the Mara Moorish, go through the Carpathians again into the Bukovina and Moldavia and back to Wallachia. So that's our journey. When we think about these regions, we need to think about it in two ways. And this is my key theme about Romania. It's not a one-dimensional place. It's a multi-dimensional place. And that's why, in a way, I think it's very interesting for Australians to travel in because there are a lot of surprising parallels with multicultural Australia and multicultural Romania. Now, one such parallel is the kind of Mitchell Europa, or what I would call the pork sausage parallel. So there's a kind of Europe of the pork sausage and the uh, sauerkraut. And that had two versions, the kind of Klein Deutsche in Berlin or the Gross Deutsche in Vienna. And we've always been more sympathetic in a way, I think, to the Viennese wider version, the Mittel Europa version. And it's interesting to see in this kind of sketch map of Mittel Europa that Romania isn't included in this German origin map. So they don't think necessarily Romania is in it. But when we think about Transylvania in particular, I think we would think it's in it. So there is a kind of pork sausage linked theme. And as you know, I love my food. So if we think about when you're buying food in a village road stall in a typical, and here's a village road stall I photographed 
on the road going through the Alt River from Wallachia to Transylvania. And here's a guy selling a whole range of Germanic horse sausage Mittel Europa goods, but also he's selling a range of Greek Kuluri Simit, Turkish Simit goods on the right hand side. And here in the front, he's he's made all kinds of wonderful um, fruit juices in his little village house, straight out of the sort of Slavonic world of what they call fruit juice heaven. And I've given you the name. So you've got a wonderful multicultural world. It's as if he's been to Odelli in Melbourne, you know, with all its multiple things. The cheeses, harder to classify. We need to speak the talk about that when we get there. So then there's another overlapping concept, which I've called the grilled meatball world. So pork sausage world, middle Europa, Germanic concept. Then there's the Balkan world of what we might call kefte in all these different kebabs, kebabchichi, kefte daki, kefte, chiftele in Romania. So this world is also part of Romania, but it's more of a Balkan orientation with the little grilled meatball as the kind of Balkan motif. And in this map, it's very interesting that it excludes Hungary, it excludes Slovenia, it excludes Slovakia. And many Romanians would argue, maybe we're not Balkan. We've got these other mountains, the Carpathians, but there you go. There are still the affinities in the food between them. And then there's the other sense in which when you have a, a spirit in Romania, plum brandy, you're drinking the, a Balkan kind of drink, Slivovitz in Serbia or Croatia, a, a brandy which you're eating with pork fat or a raw onion, which would be, again, another Balkan kind of Slavonic Russian uh, link. So we're looking at a layered society. So I hope I've intrigued you with these two ideas about that it's kind of European, kind of Germanic, Hungarian European, and it's kind of Balkan, and the two going together in this really interesting way. So why would you travel there? I think Ridgeway highlights it. One of the reasons why you would go there is because it, it is so surprising and different and mixed Sometimes we go to places where they've, they've always known what it means to be an Italian or a Tuscan or a Parisian, and there's no question about that. But this society, like our own society, is shaped by uh, multicultural pools and affinities between the grilled meatballs and the pork sausages, if you like to think of it. So it's going to a place where you learn to ask new questions questions that you never thought to ask. And you're going to a place to learn to see in slightly different ways, not in mono monocultural ways, as if you might see from a Parisian point of view. And here, I think I wanted to point out to you this very interesting Romanian intellectual here, alongside Marcel Proust, who had this very interesting thoughts about travel that you need to have your eyes open. You need new eyes. You need to know how to look, not just what to look at, but new ways to look. And that's, in a way, what I'm trying to do. But I also wanted to point out this um, interesting Romanian Francophone intellectual, Marta Bibescu, who we'll come back to again and again when we travel in this journey. And here she is with Marcel Proust at the height of Parisian culture before the First World War, a very elegant woman. So Romania's multicultural history is what I wanted to emphasise. You've really got three places, Wallachia in the south, bordering the de from the Caspians to the Danube, Transylvania, north of the Caspians, between the eastern Caspians and the southern Carpathians, and then Moldavia, on the eastern side of the Caspian Sea, moving towards the Black Sea, and each have a distinct heritage. And the, the history of Romania is remarkably similar in a way to Australia. The state of Romania is really only created, you know, in the 1850s. It's recognised internationally 
particularly by the Ottomans, only in 1878, and it expands to include the Bukovina and the Maramuresh and Moldova in 1919. Well, it's very similar history to Australia in some ways. It's, we've got colonial self-government in the 1850s in different states, federation. So you've got a multicultural place with a very old history, but it wasn't a state on its own until the 1850s, and really possibly only securely so until the end of the 19th century. So that's a kind of Australian story in some ways. Um, and what this is about is, in a sense, is that what I want to suggest to you, that many people in Western Europe think that they made their own history. The French made French history and the, the British made British history, but the Romanians could never say that because they were, didn't have their own state until the middle of the 19th century. And we have a similar kind of problem. You know, who made us? So let's go through each region one by one and, and sort of try to talk about them. Wallachia. So I'm talking about the region between the Carpathians, the southern Carpathians, and the Danube River, where you had elites that were always focused on Balkan affairs, Ottoman affairs, particularly Ottoman affairs, because they were their overlords since the early part of the 14th century. And later on in the 19th century, they were strongly French focused in the period of independence. But their cultural yearning is this traditional village world. So here we have Wallachia in my map. This is what I'm talking about, the southern area highlighted in yellow. And if we go to Bucharest, a capital that's built up in the 19th century, like any Australian capital, particularly Melbourne, you find it as little Paris, where they're aping in the most gorgeous way places that are kind of have a strong resonance to places in Melbourne, which is also a little Paris, a little Manchester. And here's the Athenaeum, where we might hope to see a classical music concert with its wonderful murals of the history of Romania and its classical portico, which could be straight out of the State Library in Melbourne or the even the shrine. And if we walk through the old districts of Bucharest, we see little Paris again with its covered arcades. Think the Block Arcade. It's gorgeous. Uh, Flinder Street Station feel of the CEC Palace. What did they do in colonial Melbourne when they wanted to build the Grand Station? They kind of built an Indian Gothic cathedral as the station. And here in Bucharest, they build something similar for their key bank building. And here again, a wonderful restaurant, a brewery restaurant. So this is the kind of equivalent of Young and Jackson's. Uh, so I've got societies that are amazingly similar. Bucharest, a beautiful city. Other parts of the city were ruined and flattened by communist dictatorship, but there's still many wonderful places. If we go out into the outskirts, we see another aspect of Wallachia, the kind of 18th century, 17th century Wallachian princes who are still under Ottoman overlordship, but are fascinated by Italian cultural styles. They build this wonderful palace at Mogoshaya with its clearly kind of Palladian, Tuscan, uh, Veneto themes with a slight hints of Ottoman decoration. So it's just this fusion, this multicultural fusion that I'm wanting to emphasize with you about traveling in Romania. The story of the guy who built this is a classic Ottoman story. He double dealed, he was found out, his family were brought to Constantinople. All of he, he and his sons were all executed in front of his wife. Horrible story. And in the end, his kingdom is closed down. So we've got a picture of Ottoman domination, but light, uh, kind of light rule. We're still in Wallachia, and we come back to my, my figure that I announced before. Princess Marta Bibescu is a wealthy woman, very noble, well-born. She renovates the palace at Mogoshaya and saves it from a ruin. And she's one of the most uh, high fashion ladies in Europe. She's a major literary figure and 
here she is portrayed in the, as an exotic beauty in European civilization in the Edwardian period, and then probably in her prime in the 20s and 1930s. So here's a woman who would have travelled back and forward between Paris and Bucharest on the Orient Express. There's every sense that one of her lovers was uh, Ramsay MacDonald, the British Prime Minister of the early 1920s. Really interesting woman. And here she is pictured in the Mogashaya Palace and in the gardens. And she wrote some of the most interesting literary works about this era. So you've got one of the leading, the most beautiful women in Europe, acknowledged so, a major intellectual figure in European civilization. And she calls Romania the country of willows. So if we go to Wallachia and we go to old Wallachia, and here's a place that we'll visit as we head out west from Bucharest, we come to Old Wallachia, which is a place oriented towards the Balkans. We see a classic Serbian, old Greek, Orthodox Balkan church here, built in the middle of the 14th century by a Wallachian prince who is under domination by the Ottomans, but the Ottomans have basically let them run their own show. The Ottomans don't want you to cease to be a Christian because if you cease to be a Christian and convert to Islam, you'll pay half the tax. They don't want that at all. They want you. So they're protecting Christianity. But when they're building in Wallachia, they're building in a classic Balkan pattern. So here's one such church. And here's another. When we move forward into going through the Carpathians in, towards Transylvania, we'll come to Kozia, another church in the classic Balkan pattern with the kind of classic Greek Orthodox, Serbian Orthodox, Bulgarian Orthodox, brick and stone mixing pattern with a little bit of Asiatic filigree stone carving here. And we'll go through passes like this one as we cast the Carpathians. So there are major highways which for thousands of years people had walked so the first European farmers had walked through these passes, through the Carpathians to get to the fertile lands in Transylvania or down into the Danube Basin. People selling carpets from the Ottoman Empire, from Persia, had come through here and they will leave the carpets in the wonderful black church in Brashov, where they have a, probably the world's best collection of Oriental carpets because they left a carpet as a gift along the way. And so you see there wonderful 16th century, 15th century Ottoman carpets in a church in Brashov. In... So here are the kind of typical paths through the Carpathians, and it's a wonderful journey in itself. So then we reach Transylvania. So we've gone from Wallachia in the south by the Danube River, we've gone over the mountains and we're into a higher plain with some mountains in the middle called the Apusheni Mountains. And we're in a region that's Romance language speaking. That is, they're speaking a language which is like French and Spanish and Italian, but they're surrounded by Slavs. They have a Roman history since the time of Trajan, 100 CE, AD. They're Orthodox, but they're surrounded and colonised by German-speaking colonists, but they use Slavonic and Latin in their diplomacy, iconography, literacy. So they're part, Transylvania is part of Middle Europa through colonization. And here you see it, it's kind of an Australian pattern in a way, except in Australia, the, the colonists set, set themselves and lived in the middle of their farms. Here, they're still European in the sense that they settle in the village and their farms are trailing behind them. So here we are, we've come over the mountains and we're in Transylvania, a kind of exotic location. And we get to these wonderful German settler towns created in the 12th century. So they've got a settler colonial society that is six times older than Australian settler colonial society. And it has all kinds of interesting rules so these settler colonists were brought in there by the Hungarian kings to populate 
a region that had been devastated by wave after wave of barbarian invasion, the last of which was the, were the Hungarian kings. And in these towns, they're overwhelmingly Germanic, and that stays the case right up until the Second World War. And in 1945, all the Germans had to leave. Well, basically, they thought, if we stay, we'll be in jail, so we will leave. So you get these really interesting Germanic places Middle Europa places with interesting histories. So here we see some of the, the cities that we'll visit with the market square, the classic kind of Central European heritage with clear Germanic overtones, which I'll quickly run through. And we also get these really interesting fortified churches in Transylvania. They're worried sick about Ottoman attack, Ottoman raiders, and there's in the 15th, 16th, and even into the 17th centuries, because you remember the, the Ottomans besieged Vienna in 1683. So they went right past Transylvania to besiege Vienna in 1683. They also besieged Vienna in 1529. So you've got these walled, really interesting walled churches with stables and houses to shelter the colonial German population from Ottoman attack. Fascinating places. Let me now move into the northern Transylvania, a really lovely vision. One of the most fun places we go is this wonderful cemetery near the border with Slovakia, where you have this wonderful guy who celebrated everyone in his village when, by making a, a little tomb for them in the village churchyard. It's called the Merry Cemetery in Maramuresh. So we're in the north here. And we see here the most amazing vernacular architecture in wood, a very timber-rich area. So we're seeing here things that you would only see in Europe, in Norway, in Sweden, in Northern European Russia. Architecture without an architect, vernacular architecture, homemade architecture of the most interesting versions. And we visit little villages like this one, Rosavnia. And we go to a lovely hill church. So this is what it looks like inside, where the villages have decorated it in the early 18th century. But the church dates from much older than that. And we see this very interesting window into popular religiosity and what people wanted to paint without a kind of script from some bishop or... And these villages were a very important find, which will be in my next slide, was found in the roof here. Uh, in that little gap in the floor. And that was the first written document in Romania, 15th century written document. And you can see that the charming naive drawings of the knights here done by the probably the Orthodox cleric. But the interesting point from my point of view is that he was writing in Slavonic. He is conducting the worship in Slavonic. But the people in the church are Romanian speakers. So you've got this very interesting pattern of kind of old Europe where the church is conducted in a language other than the language of the peoples around. So you see here this um, interesting document. So if we come back through the Carpathians, you see really lovely 19th century castles with a kind of fantasy castles, neo-German Renaissance castles, built by the kings of Romania, nominated in the 19th century by the great powers. So the great powers, after the Crimean War, had allowed Moldavia and Wallachia to leave Ottoman overlordship, or rather technically so, they were autonomous. And then in 1878, after another victory against the Ottoman Empire, Romania is now independent. And in that period, the great powers nominated who will be the king of, of Romania, and they nominate a Hohenzollern, Sigmaringen, kind of Danish German dynasty. And they build these lovely but really kind of toy castles in Pelish. And here's another one built by the son of the first king. Uh, who builds another one uh, with his English wife, Queen Mary, Marie, who is one of the key figures 
in the intellectual revival of Romanian. So she was an English woman who was fascinated by Romanian culture. She was the son, the daughter of Prince Albert, who visited Australia where he was shot in Sydney. So there's some, again another kind of contrast. So you get this kind of 19th century world. If we move over the Carpathians to the east, to Moldavia, we get another really interesting where, so we've got now Romanian speakers, Romance language speakers, who are deeply influenced by orthodoxy, of course, as were the others in Wallachia and Transylvania, but they are more influenced by the Rus in Kiev, in Moscow and in Lithuania. And they're also influenced by the Ottomans in the Black Sea. The Ottomans are their rulers until the middle of the 19th century, but they're ruling in a very light way. They have an ancient Roman history, which is why they speak a Romance language. They're Orthodox. They're surrounded by Slavic speakers. They use Slavonic and Greek in their services in church, in their diplomacy. And they feel strongly like the Wallachians south of the Carpathians and now the east of the Carpathians feel very strongly that they belong to a Byzantine Commonwealth with orthodoxy. And what's very interesting in this is that this is the time when Constantinople is being taken by the Ottomans and the Commonwealth is weak in a Greek sense, but it's very, very strong in a Romanian, a Serbian, a Bulgarian, a Russian sense. And that's one of the really interesting things about creativity in this region. So here we are in the East now. And after 1918, Moldova, which is now an independent state, was also part of Romania and Moldavia. And it's historically very, has strong affinities with Moldavia. So what have we got here? We've got a really interesting set and we'll visit several different, really important monasteries and centers of the state that are walled castles. And so the Romance language speaking Byzantine faith people are building a better Byzantine world even after the conquest of Constantinople. And we'll see this. And the state and the church go hand in glove in building these wonderful sites. Here's one of the first of them at Putna built by Stephen the Great in thanks for a victory over the Ottomans, which in practice only meant that he just paid tribute to the Ottomans. He didn't have to, um, he wasn't ruled directly by them. But you're seeing these gorgeous settings and we're also seeing a world shaped by an amazing iconography where we have something unique in Europe, a world heritage place, places where we have religious liturgical paintings, not only inside the church, but all around the outside under the wide eaves of the churches. And they are focused on a sort of intellectual agenda that I'll try to explain in the tour and go into more detail about. But it's basically about their belief that they were living in the end times, that the apocalypse was coming, that the Ottomans were a symbol of the end of the world and that soon Christ would return and that they had this very interesting theology which they're painting all over the church and remember that the church's services are being conducted in Greek or in Slavonic but the faithful are Romance language speakers, they're Romanians. So they need the help of images and pictures in order to understand their place in the world and what's happening. And so here's one such image, very well preserved of the river of fire. And so the, the idea of the tree of, of Jesse is also on another such church at Moldovica with its state there. The idea that redemption is at hand. The Byzantine empire may have fallen and we are Byzantines, but it will return. And they're pointing out this commonwealth in which they're living, in which the, the central power has collapsed in Constantinople from a Greek Orthodox point of view. But redemption is at hand, and these people are kind of framing it, their sense of belonging. 
And you're seeing in some of the most beautiful artwork, late medieval artwork that you could be seeing in Europe in a place that you probably never associated great art with. And here we see another such site. There are many Voronets built by Stephen the Great. And you can see that this guy with all this wealth, he's got autonomy, but he has to fight for it really hard against Poles, against Ottomans, against Tatars. And he's got affinities with the Slavonic world, but he's definitely a Romanian. Okay, so let me try to push forward and talk about things that I puzzle me still when I'm thinking about Romania and showing you Romania. So I'll dance around a bit here. Back in Transylvania, remember Biatan, the, the, where I showed you the aerial photograph of the settler colonial town? So it's a settler colonial town that is a millennium old that only ended as Germanic in 1945. And what we see here is a town that's very interesting. It has a Protestant history from the Reformation. So there's that complication to discuss as well. And if you go in the town, one of the really interesting things is, is that inside that church here, there's a really interesting list of people who died fighting for Germany and the German Empire in the First World War and in the Second World War. And they're all German. But if you go out and down into the village through the main square, you'll find another war memorial opposite the primary school and all the names are Romanian. So the two communities barely mixed. And there's another oddity that in the church, and here's a model of the church and a map of the church, there's a really strange piece of iconography, a Commedia dell'arte figure, the Harlequin, painted on the church wall. What the hell? There's also a glorious organ there from the Reformation period. I don't get it. Something to discuss. When we go to the painted monasteries, we get something else that's really interesting. We have images of the siege of Constantinople telling a Bible story about the, the 7th century siege of Constantinople by the armies of the prophet Muhammad. And they failed because of the showing of the holy face of Christ on the walls. So, but... The really interesting thing is, is why would they be celebrating a successful siege of Constantinople after, in the 8th, 7th century after having witnessed uh, just a century before they painted this, a successful Islamic siege of Constantinople? What are they trying to say? It's a kind of really interesting. And they don't just do that in Moldovica. They do it in Voronets as well. So are they saying that this is an end time, that we will be redeemed, that the Ottomans will be driven back, you know? It's a very interesting kind of question. And then there's the, going back to the river of fire question. It tells biblical stories about the weighing of the dead from these biblical texts. It shows you that when people die, they'll be judged by Christ reigning in heaven with the scales weighing their hearts, and then the damned will go forward into the river of fire. And who is in the river of fire? A whole bunch of Muslims, Turks, and Tatars lined up, ready to have their souls judged, and they're all going to heaven. Here it is, the, the Ebreski, the Musulmani, Al-Turki, Al-Tatarski, you know, this is a period when the Ottomans are ruling and they've built this church and they're saying that all the Ottomans are going to hell in a hard basket. So how hard was their domination? Really interesting question. And then there's this thinking goes on in contemporary Romania. So here's a church from 2011 built after the attack on the World Trade Center with Osama bin Laden uh, heading towards hell. As a modern historian, I, mean, I trained and used to teach a lot about the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution. And the picture is one thing that we don't, it's harder to see, that the Romanian people, particularly in Transylvania, but also in Wallachia and Moldavia, right up until the end of the 19th century, were serfs. In Transylvania, they were dominated by Hungarian lords, one of whom built this castle, this landed estate, in 
Wallachia and Moldavia, they would have been dominated by boyars who were, in fact, Romanian-speaking. But in Transylvania, you've got them dominated by German speakers or mostly Hungarian speakers. And when you enter this world, you won't, you imagine the world of the villagers who you can't see. It's a bit like upstairs, downstairs. And so here you see the fabulous wealth exploited from the Romanian peasantry in serfed. And this is the country house of the Apafi family. And here's the townhouse of another powerful family, this time in Cluj, Napoja, the town we will visit. So we need to think about the wealth generated in this society. And because I used to teach about the French Revolution, I thought I'd show you a kind of French revolutionary moment. In 1781, well before the French Revolution of 1789, the Prince peasants rose up in revolt, wondering why serfdom was not being abolished when the emperor, Joseph II, had abolished it in other parts of the Habsburg Empire in 1781. And when they dared say that and rose up in rebellion, their leaders were captured and in the main square or just outside the town of Shigishora, a town we'll visit, they were executed in public. And you can see that their claims were very French Revolution. Let's abolish serf uh, nobility. Landlords should leave. Noblemen should pay taxes just like anybody else. Okay. I've tried to give you a sense of Romania as why it's a really interesting place to visit. So multicultural, so many layers, a modern history that's rather like Australia, a settler colonial past in many places that's rather like Australia. But it's a settler colonial past that lasted a millennium from the 12th century to 1945. A place that's a fusion of Middle Europa, Balkans, a really unusual place in the sense that it is Romance language speaking, surrounded by Slavs, Hungarians, both South Slav and East Slav. And so there's this really interesting thing, which is similar to when I go to Slovenia, that why do these people succeed in preserving their culture against the odds? And they do so whether they're dominated by Ottomans, Habsburgs, Poles, Saxon German colonists. And so it's a really interesting place to visit, a place that opens your eyes, a place that helps you ask new questions. And so I think that's your time to ask me some questions. Hello, I'm really interested in this tour, but I'd like to know what the roads are like. Are they very windy and difficult? There are some windy roads, but surprisingly, when you go through the main passes, yes, there are some windy bits, but you've got a lot of investment by the European Union in improving the roads. One of the great benefits of the European Union is that they pay for German Autobahn road engineers to build roads all over Europe. So it's kind of a sweetener for German industry as well. Um, Adrian, I'm interested in the origin of the language. I've always heard that it is the closest European language to ancient Latin. Is that so? Yes, and I think that is so. So you've got to imagine that uh, the Dacians, Dacians are the native speakers of the region, and they're a, a Thracian-speaking people. Although, uh, So you have Thracian population from what is what we would call now Thrace, Bulgaria, Romania, moving a bit further west. So these are Thracians. Thracian is a language that didn't really survive beyond the earliest medieval period. So we don't really know what it was like. The Romans come, you know, they've got contacts across the Danube, you know, in the time of Augustus and whatever. But Trajan comes because the Thracian rule, the so-called Dacians, between 90 and 110, they're kind of Romanized by Trajan. And he builds this mighty bridge across the Danube and erects Trajan's column, which tells the whole story of that campaign between 90 and 110. And then those Thracian people living there are, are Romanized, which is what had happened in the rest of the kind of northern Balkans as well. So whereas, say, in Thrace, in Greek Thrace, 
They were Romanized in the sense of speaking Greek. So the Emperor Galerius, one of the most important figures, early 4th century, he's a Thracian from kind of northern Bulgaria, kind of Wallachia, and he doesn't like Latin at all. And, and he's not too keen on Greek either, but that was very controversial. Okay, so they're thoroughly, the Dacians are thoroughly Romanized and they adopt a version of Latin that is deeper and then is completely isolated from all the other versions of Latin in Spain, in Italy, uh, Portugal. And so it's kind of frozen. And then the, the kind of really other really interesting question is that how did they manage to survive surrounded by imperialistic German speakers? Uh, religious culture, which is shaped by Greek and Slavonic, and yet they're still determinedly Romanian. And that's why they're similar in some ways to Croatians and Slovenians, because they also were heavily threatened by Hungarians and Germans. And yet they stayed strong as Slav speakers. So that kind of pattern is interesting. But again, the language is very, the question is very interesting because nobody's writing anything much in Romanian until the 19th century. It's not a literary language. There's one really important exemption for that, which I'm writing a book about because it's kind of Russian Ottoman encounter. In 1711, a prince of Moldavia, who was living in Constantinople as a hostage, wrote the first works in Romanian, and he's doing it in Constantinople, but he end, ended up having to flee with the Russian army to Russia, and so nobody in Romania knew that in the beginning of the 18th century there was been this really interesting prince who had written something in Romanian. So they had to reinvent it, and it was only late in the 19th century when they had begun to write a Romanian literature, which we'll discuss when we go through Romania, that they discovered that actually there was someone 150 years before who had been trying to do it. And had the language changed very much in that yes. time? Yes, so he was a very well-educated guy, a really interesting Romanian intellectual who was very interested in Ottoman literature, wrote the first Ottoman history, composed music for the Ottoman court, uh, also wrote and was fluent in Russian, you know, he, but he had a very highfalutin kind of highly educated Romanian and that didn't stick. So it's a very similar problem to what you find in Greece between Katharevusa and Demotica. And that discussion dominated 19th and 20th century Greek history. Some people thought you had to be educated, not in the language you speak, but in the language you should speak. Yeah. Anyway, so the language the language issues are very interesting, and we can we'll discuss them as we move around. Um, yeah. I'm just wondering where the Viking expeditions down the various rivers if they fitted into any of this at all. Yeah, that's a really good question. They certainly shape the whole Russian history. So if we were talking about Russia, mm -hmm. you know, the reason we have a a Rus state is because the Vikings created the state by sailing down the great Russian rivers, either to Baghdad via the Volga or to Constantinople via the Dnieper. And, and there are portages there. There's a, there's a certain point where you, if you sail as a Viking past St. Petersburg, where, which didn't exist then, and then go down through the lake, a big lake at the south where the great battles were fought in the Second World War, and then go down the Ilmen River. If you go over one hill to the right or to the east, you can put your boat into the Dnieper River and sail to Constantinople, which is what the Vikings first did in the ninth century. Or if you go to the left on the other side of the hill, you can put your boat into the upper reaches of the Volga River and sail all the way to Baghdad. In Romania, no. They're not interested in the Danube. They are interested, you know, when I lead a group in Constantinople, in, in Istanbul, we can go into the Hagia Sophia Cathedral and you can see where a Viking guardsman in the 9th, 10th century had written, Hulfdan was ear, you know, and he wrote it in runes. So they're very important in Constantinople. They're very important guarding the emperors of Constantinople. 
it's very interesting, for example, that Harold Hadrada, the Norwegian guy who fought Harold Godwin at Stanford Bridge in 1066, he came from Norway, but he had already been in a previous Norwegian crisis, living in Constantinople, coming via Russia. You think the 11th century was a small place. The guy who fought in Yorkshire against Harold Godwinson, Harold Hardrada, had lived and worked in Bulgaria and Constantinople. And had married a Kievan princess. <laughs> so, but in Romania, it's still, I think, in that period, not so vital. Do we have any more questions? Well, if not, I will take the opportunity to give a huge thank you to Adrian for a very, very wonderful, interesting, visually spectacular tour through Romania. Hopefully it's whetted people's appetites to this incredible part of the world. So thank you again, Adrian, and I look forward to seeing you all on the next Travel Tuesday. That was fabulous, Adrian. So thank you very much. Thank you, Adrian. Good, Good night. night.